one day we'll be able to handle some of, or take some of the workload off of us, if not all of it. Um, and then of course we're all connected, you know. So, so these are the things that are really fundamentally changing automotive. You will see um, our industry probably transform faster. Uh, this is not my quote. I think it was the CEO from GM, and I apologize for not knowing his name. We'll see more changes in the next uh, 10 years in automotive than we have in the last 100 years. Um, it, it'll be a fundamentally different place. I think that's good for that slide. Any questions here? I mean, I'm, I have a, a monotone voice. I'm kind of putting you guys to sleep. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let me just talk about some of the use cases, and I've got to back up to read these. Can I take this off? All right, so, so this is where the rubber hits the road. Um, these are, are just a few of the use cases that we're talking about in mobility, where, again, these are not really about cryptocurrency and securities and how you make an investment to get a return on your Bitcoin, right? This is how can we use the underlying technology, that trust, trusted technology, uh, to change the way that we uh, operate. So the first one is digital uh, history and tracking. I think I have a slide on this. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. I'm just going to read them off real quick um, and just give you a little bit of color. So, so this is really the identity um, that we talked about earlier. You need to have the identity of the vehicle, of the intersection, of the other infrastructure that need for mobility has to be reliable uh, and has to be trusted. Uh, supply, chain check, uh, supply chain tracking is really important. We'll talk about odometer fixing and and other uh, problems, problems that you have with uh, vehicles and how they impact uh, maybe safety and other things. Um, machine to machine payments. Can I have my car pay your car to get out of my way so it can go by? <laughs> kind of cool. um, and particularly if there's no cost um, or, or the, the cost structure is, is different than what we have today. And then, of course, car and ride sharing, uh, there's opportunities there. I think the number is 45% from some of the the ride hailing services that they take from the auto, the, the drivers themselves. So if you can reduce some of that overhead, maybe we can drop some of those costs, make it more accessible, more affordable. Uh, and then of course, you know, I want to pay for my Starbucks, I want to pay for my gas, all of those kinds of things. Uh, it gets really interesting when you don't own the car anymore. It's just, it's access. So who's paying for that, that fuel? And, and maybe it's not fuel anymore. Um, I'll talk about this in just a second, but uh, maybe it's it's uh, electrons you're paying for, right? Um, and then um, in in our industry right now, uh, there's a gentleman named Gil Pratt. He's pretty famous for the autonomous vehicle space. He ran the DARPA programs, uh, those those contests that see who could run a track autonomously with nobody in the car. And over the last 20 years or so, he joined Toyota Research Institute. Um, I'm I'm also from Toyota, um, and he states that we'll need about a half a trillion miles of a driving time, recorded driving time with these high, uh, highly expensive but uh, high um, fidelity sensors um, to find all the edge cases so that we can really make a car drive autonomously. This particular one um, addresses how can you, as an automaker who's collecting all this valuable data, monetize it and sell it back to the market so we can achieve that half a trillion miles. Because frankly, if I'm Toyota, I kind of keep it over here. The tragedy of the commons kind of at play here, where I, you know, it's better for the entire community if we share the data, but I have to, I have to retain it um, today. And so we're working on ways that we can share that data, retain the data rights, the data property rights, and at the same time, uh, monetize the, the, the uh, information. Does anybody know how your roads are paid for? Taxes on what? On gas. What happens when you're all driving electric cars? Do our roads just fall apart because we no longer have petroleum-based taxes? We run into some problems in the future, right? So this area here around usage-based transactions um, is really quite interesting because we, we have an, an opportunity, nobody wants to be taxed, but we can pay taxes on a more incremental basis. Um, we can pay insurance, we can pay tolls, you know, those kinds of things to, to uh, you know, some of us believe that there's a lot of carbon being produced by vehicles, maybe we can have uh, carbon credits if you have your car full of people as we transition into 
into new uh, modes of transportation. And then of course, just tokenizing the mobility ecosystem, uh, kind of back to my point earlier about my car paying your car or, or getting some value out of the vehicle. Um, so these are the use cases that Moby is working on. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, I'm not gonna go through them in, in detail because you guys have sat through a lot of detail already. Um, but this is just to basically tell you, here's four companies that did these proof of concepts. They work perfectly in blockchain. Um, and, and these aren't the only four. This is maybe a third of the companies that did this last year using blockchain technologies. Um, this is something that's very doable. Um, can, we, can we go to the next slide? Uh, obviously, we talked about uh, the right hailing potential. Somebody went through in a lot of detail what IPFS was. You know, these automakers have used these and, and uh, have been quite uh, successful in, in their POC implementations. But we're still not to market yet for some reason. Had a great implementation, spent a lot of money building out that POC, but we couldn't bring it to market at Toyota. And there's a reason for it. And I'll, I'll talk to that in just a second. Can you go to the next one? I think there's one, maybe one more. Yeah, and so this is uh, IBM, UBS, and ZF. Does anybody know who ZF is? Does anybody know who TRW Parts or was? So ZF acquired them years ago. Uh, they were one of the largest tier one part suppliers. We had most of the tier one part suppliers working with Bobi. Um, but these three got together and created the car <coughs> wall where they could exchange value, right, for that, with the car. Um, this is actually something somebody could use today. It's in production. Uh, can we go on through? But we have a problem. Blockchain is a team sport, as I'd like to say. Brian Bellendorf um, is really quite a brilliant guy. He's uh, with Hyperledger. He's one of, um, or I should say Hyperledger is one of four or five alliances we have. Um, uh, Ethereum through consensus. Uh, Joe Lubin, who's uh, one of the founders and on the board of, of Ethereum, is one of our advisors. Brian Bellendorf is one of our advisors. Um, uh, IOTA, the Trusted Internet of Thing Alliance. We are not a, we're not here to promote one particular technology. Uh, we're here to make sure that the technologies meet the needs of the, of the mobility space. So we work with them all, I guess is the point. Uh, what he means by block, blockchain as a team sport is when you have a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, I cannot be speaking Spanish while you're speaking English. Right? We have to be kind of talking in the same language. That's probably a sensitive way of putting it. Sorry, I didn't mean to <laughs> touch on anything there. But you know, we have to have an agreement on how we're going to communicate. What are the protocols that we'll use? In our industry, we didn't have those. Um, so uh, what, we, what we really did is, um, uh, Chris Ballinger, who's the former CFO for uh, Toyota Financial Services and responsible for uh, mobility services at Toyota, recognized that the problem is everybody's working towards a minimum viable product. You know, everybody wants to go start a business and create a blockchain solution. And, and what has happened, what we see over the last two or three years is I get Lamborghini. We're, I get Lamborghini to build a project with me. And then I'm going to go try to sell the Lamborghini solution to the next company, Ferrari. And Ferrari says, no, 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 no. That's the Lamborghini solution. I need to work with somebody else. And so there's this innovation problem that we have. We, we, we have case after case after case of creating these great POCs, but it's blockchain's a team sport, right? And, and we have to be working on the same set of standards. So um, Chris coined this term, minimum viable ecosystem not minimal viable product. Um, it's more important that you have the community to together. And this gets, gets back to your MPS question. Right? If you don't have enough of the parties on, on that particular blockchain, uh, then we then you kind of run into some challenges. So this is what we what Moby's real all about. Um, so we we announced Moby um, on May 2nd in Dubai. Um, just happened to be a convenient timing before consensus and some other other shows, and we were ready to announce. It uh, it really blew us out of the water. The kind of response we had, um, frankly, municipalities from all over the world, tow road providers, insurance companies, um, obviously automakers. We'll talk a little bit about who announced it with us in a moment. Um, motorcycle companies, scooter companies, you know, shared service uh, ride hailing companies. 
energy companies, everybody who has a, a role in mobility is very interested in this. And the reason being is if I can have a wallet installed in a car and I can have a monetary unit exchanging value back and forth in that car pre-installed, then there's tremendous things I can do in the, in the ecosystem. So we, can we go to the next slide? We created a we created Moby. Moby's a nonprofit. We are not a, 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 a company that's picking the use cases per se, or, or an organization that's picking the the technology winners. It's our it's our members that are. So our uh, our participants in, in the Moby community uh, will show in just a moment. But basically, they're they are the top uh, blockchain specialists, either in startups from. Switzerland and Japan and Munich and uh, the Silicon Valley area, Detroit and Dallas and wherever it might be, they're all participating in this community to set these standards. Um, and we're really kind of following open innovation techniques, and I want to talk about that in a minute. Um, I'll come back to it just after I we go to the next slide. We can, I think it's the next slide. I don't have my deck in front of me. Can you go to the next one? Yeah. So, so um, there's a couple things that I, I just want to one I want to reiterate. And then uh, another that another stat up there that's kind of important. So we have probably 90% of the world's automakers involved. Um, probably the top 10, uh, five or 10 uh, tier one part suppliers. Um, we're actually being approached by other uh, industries like. In, in aerospace and places like that, military applications that all recognize the need to innovate faster. That if I'm an automaker and I, I have an R&D budget and I can hire a few of you people, I can spend a lot of money but not get as far as I could is if I join a consortium like this. And, and the thing that's important about that is, is that you, it's this open innovation model. And it's what's made the IT sector so successful. I'm a, I'm a technologist. I started programming in assembly in high school. I've been doing nothing but delivery work my entire life. And we've benefited in our industry by having things like, everybody knows what Linux is, right? With open standards. Everybody knows what TCP IP is or the, the internet. All these are open standards and they've really accelerated our, that industry's ability or that sector's ability to grow. The automotive industry hasn't grown at that rate. But we have an opportunity to grow like that if we can innovate collaboratively, right? So when you guys look at, at your investments in, in these ICOs and you have this great white paper, we're gonna be the we're gonna be the blockchain of t-shirts. All t-shirts are gonna be on our blockchains. I don't know what that means exactly, but you know, you see some funky uh, white papers out there. Um, look at the transaction volumes, look at the ecosystem. Do you have do they have a minimum viable ecosystem? Do they have a, a way to to achieve a minimum viable ecosystem? Or do they just have an interesting proposition um, and, and some confusing technology behind it, right? So just be cautious, uh, or conscious, I should say, uh, about how they're going to achieve that kind of minimum viable ecosystem. Uh, the, other, the other stat on here, the other two things, or I mean, the other thing I want to just re-emphasize right there at the top is, you know, we can, we as an industry can do a lot better. We can be more efficient. We can be more affordable. We can be more accessible. Um, I can stop missing my grandkids' baseball games because I'm stuck in traffic coming in from LA, right? 96% of the time, 96% of the time, your car sits idle. It's your second biggest investment in your life, probably. And 96% of the time, it's not used. So we can find ways in that usage base, all we talked about, and the ride sharing, ride hailing kinds of things, of getting you to not own the car, but just get in the car, right? And when you're done, somebody else gets in the car. And when somebody else is done, they get in the car, right? And we could reduce the cost and the environmental impact of having all of those machines sitting idle, rusting, in your driveway, right? So these are these are really great opportunities for us as an industry. We think blockchain is one of those solutions. Blockchain is not going to solve all problems, but it does do things differently. It's a different architecture, as we heard about a little earlier. It's a different kind of architecture than what you're used to with your cloud-based um, uh, 
solutions, server-based, web services-based solutions, if you will, SOA-based solutions. Anyways, um, why don't you go to the next slide? I can't remember how many more I have in here. That's it. So these are the three takeaways. Again, remember it's all about trust. Blockchain is about trust. Where we're at today with the technology is very mature. These, uh, these consensus protocols, um, they're developing. There'll be a lot better, faster, cheaper, more efficient protocols that are just as trusted as we have with uh, proof of works. Um, uh, you need to find organizations that you can be part of that are developing these minimal, minimum in, uh, minimum viable ecosystem. And if you happen to be in an industry other than automotive, uh, you should probably look to build some kind of consortium with your partners to figure out how to innovate more quickly. Blockchain requires you to collaborate with your with your competitors and others. Right? You have to find the line of what is open and what is value adding. Uh, but those are the those are or that's an important thing to be able to accomplish. Um, anyway, so that's my presentation. Any questions? And a few. Sorry. Yeah, there's actually quite a few companies um, all over the world that are very much focused on on that kind of solution. Um, so, is the customer like buying the time? Yeah, they're subscribing to, to access to vehicles that are distributed around and they go find them quickly on their connected phone, uh, drop in the car and drive away, right? And then return the car to a certain spot. Um, that, that is the very tip of the iceberg that will get more and more efficient as we, we learn more. I'm sorry, somebody was over here and then you. Yeah. If you store a lot of data in blockchain, how easy it is to search the data you store? Well, I, I, we should probably start by saying we may not be storing a lot of data in the blockchain. Um, there may be on-chain and off-chain aspects of the transactions. You may uh, store certain elements on the chain, certain elements off the chain. That's one of the things that we have to evaluate in every use case. Um, uh, I, the, the question about how much can you store, I don't really technically know the answer. You know, what's the, what's the upper limits of, of that? Um, I would say I'd look at the problem differently. What do I need to share? Or what needs to be on the chain, either private or public? And then what do we have to do to, to make the protocol support those kinds of things? That's, that's my viewpoint. I, Let's find, define the problem, the business problem first, and then figure out how you morph the technologies to accept, uh, support it. So, I, I, sorry, it's not a direct answer to your question. Okay, okay thank you. Sir. Um, it seems like businesses uh, okay. already have a lot of trust with sending out POs and just expecting it to get paid. And, um, where does the blockchain uh, excel versus just like paying a third party to keep track of transactions? Well, uh, so so um, if, if anybody, if you guys didn't hear that, the question is, where does blockchain add add value that a traditional uh, transaction model would take or support? Right, where where I'm paying a third party to manage my invoicing process and, and get a return. Um, so so one of the things that we believe is true with blockchain is that the cost to do those transactions will be significantly reduced. Um, orders, maybe five orders of magnitude less expensive than running, let's say, a credit card, right? Um, so if I'm trying to do usage-based toll roads and usage-based taxes and things of this nature, or I'm trying to do machine, you know, I'm trying to tell your car, I'll pay you a little bit to move over, I can't have a, a $2 cost to process that transaction, or even a 25 cent cost. I might be only giving you a, a third of a cent or something, right? So, so certainly that's one place where we'll see a reduction or an adoption of these technologies. It'll, it'll, it'll enable new capabilities that we don't have at all. And then in the traditional space, we have problems with trust. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about, about uh, Equifax and, and uh, Wells Fargo and, and, and these trusted centralized almost monopolies of data or services that that we can um, reduce the cost of those transactions, maybe just intermediate some of them in some cases. There's a lot of extra cost in a vehicle 
for all of that, those kinds of overheads. And if our goal, if you go back to one slide, I don't know if, oh, never mind, our goal is to make mobility more efficient, affordable, accessible to people, we've got to look at where we can reduce costs, right? And so watching helps us do that. And every little bit that we can do, I think the better, we're better off. Do you have an idea how much that is? Uh, Done any analysis? No, no, we've not done a detailed analysis. We have a, a Moby's configured or set up with uh, working groups um, and committees. Um, each of the working working groups works on one of those different use cases we talked about, and then each of the committees are kind of more horizontal. We we do have a committee that's focused on economics and business models to understand exactly the answer to that to that question, um, and that's spinning up kind of right now. And, and Chris, who's uh, a monetary economist and has been for, uh, and, and very experienced, is kind of chairing that particular committee. So we're always looking for, if you guys are, uh, maybe this is a, a shameless plug, not, I don't know how I'm doing that time, but um, one of the things we try to do with those working groups and committees to engage students and the academic institutions around the companies or around the world is we are, uh, we have something called Moby Fellows. And what we try to do is we try to get a student from uh, a university that has a particular uh, skill set around e economics or around IP and licensing, uh, open source stuff, or whatever it might be, um, or is interested in insurance, whatever it might be, to be a uh, kind of a research assistant on those working groups. Uh, we already have folks from blockchain at Berkeley, at Slack, at uh, Stanford. Uh, we're talking with the, uh, the uh, Michigan um, uh, Michigan State, no, no, Michigan, sorry, and um, uh, Ontario, and a couple of other universities around the world, Cambridge, um, there's like one in Germany. So anyways, we, we really want to be inclusive. Uh, we set up a structure that, that tries to pull in academics, tries to pull in um, alliances with other, other uh, nonprofits, government agencies, and then of course the technology startups and these folks that are actually providing the services. So uh, we tr try to be as inclusive as we can. Sorry, I'll answer your question. Awesome. With blockchain, the data is on the blockchain. So does that mean that there will be no more selling? No, I think it's just the opposite. So with blockchain, I can maybe retain the data locally, not put it up in a central hub that I lose control of very quickly. I can grant you access to run your, your logic See, see, we, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm probably going over, is that okay? I'm not kind of time. Um, so for 30, 40 years now, in technology, what have we been doing? We've been building bigger and bigger networks so that we can get more and more data to the central hub. And then we can run our logic on that central hub, aggregate it, process it, and get some kind of value out of it, right? What blockchain's gonna do, and I think this, we're just beginning to see this with Ethereum's contracts ideas and hyperledgers, is that we're seeing, for the first time, uh, logic sent to the data. So instead of data being sent to the hub, to the central center, the server, now logic is being distributed out in real time as a contract to the data. When I'm, when I'm running an autonomous, autonomous vehicle with terabytes of data that I'm collecting off of the sensor, trying to pull that data, munge it up, and put it in some central place, it's kind of an expensive proposition. It's probably easier for me to send a secure, encrypted algorithm that I still own down to that set of data, have it run its machine learning or whatever predictive algorithms, whatever it might need, get the result back, aggregate it with my other stuff, and then I have my result, right? So we're just starting to do this. This is why Ethereum and blockchain are really made such a big impact, in my opinion, in the architectures that we have going forward. I'm sorry. Do you see a scenario project uh, in the foreseeable future that has a marriage between IoT, 5G, and blockchain within the mobility space? Yeah, so so absolutely IoT, the Trusted Internet of Things Alliance is a, is an alliance partner with us. Uh, Zach Manian is uh, the executive director. He's a great supporter of Moby. Uh, he's one on our board of advisors. Um, th this entire space around, uh, can I put like a RFID tab as a blockchain component? on a uh, component in the car. There, there's several companies, uh, Oak Innovation, Riddle & Code, 
some other folks are doing that kind of work so that each component in the car is actually part of the blockchain. Um, so yes, I think there's an integration of all of these things uh, that, that's going on right now. I asked a lot of questions over there, so I'm gonna come over this way. No more questions. <laughs> We actually have one online, if you don't mind answering. Sure, sure. So we have one from Victor P. He's saying, in terms of Mobi, seems like proof of location would be an important part of this. Yeah. Can you discuss briefly on-chain, off-chain, and both? For specifically to proof of location, I don't know. But, um, so I'm not an expert on all these topics, um, uh, but um, we have two companies um, XYO and phone that are specifically focused on proof of, or on uh, uh, location blockchains um, and having trusted locations. Um, I think there's still room to, to work in that area uh, that need to be developed. Um, as far as on-chain and off-chain, uh, that topic, I'm not sure what the context of that is, but, but uh, whether you're storing data on-chain or at some hybrid model where some of the data is on-chain and some of the data is off-chain, um, uh, all those things have to be determined. So, so for example, if I'm uh, one of the interesting use cases in supply chain is I want to know the bill of material for a vehicle. I want to know that this Ford Explorer had this Firestone tire on it, right? Now, that's an interesting thing, but I can't just put that out in the public because then all the competitors are going to know what parts are being sold on this car and can negotiate contracts, and it's not a really good free market situation, right? So there may be some things that are private in a private chain some things that are public and a public chain, some things that are on-chain, and some things that are off-chain. These are all design considerations in, in the way you develop the, the solution. I'm sorry, you had a question. Uh, kind of related question, similar to Mobi, are you aware of any other consortiums for other industries like insurance or kind of thing? Uh, yeah, there, there are, um, particularly in insurance. Um, but interestingly enough, um, there's there well there's first of all the, the one that I know probably the most about is the R3 consortium in the financial services banking area. Um, that's that's a group of, of large banks that are trying to figure out how to best leverage um, uh, blockchain in a similar kind of way. Um, there's uh, one uh, or, I'm sorry there's two insurance specific companies um, or, or blockchain consortiums. Um, they are. A little bit more focused on on the processes of the internal processes happening within insurance. They're not so much focused on usage-based insurance. So we're working with with them. We may create an alliance. We don't have one yet, um, um, or we're certainly working with most of their partners. Do you know, can you name those insurance ones? I don't think I can. Um, Maybe I'll find. We could talk about sure. it. Okay, oh, one more question. How can you make existing vehicles and trucks more compliant? That's an interesting question. There's a there's actually a company called CarBlock as part of the consortium uh, that is focused exactly on that thing. Can I, can I plug in a little adapter to the car uh, and then have it participate in the in that ecosystem? Um, it, it, it depends on the use case. If it's like usage based insurance and I want to you know, track driving behaviors or I want to um, uh, track risk, if you will, for lack of a better term, um, then that thing might work. Uh, but if it's negotiating payments with the car, I, I don't know if it would work. It maybe it would. Um, so there's, there's different use cases, and, but, but there are companies that are, are looking at aftermarket uh, some form of space. I, I hope one of the things that you're taking away from this is that there's a lot of hype around cri cryptocurrencies, and maybe that's what's got everybody's attention in, in the room. For a lot of people's attention in the room, um, but there's real practical applications to this digital ledger technology um, that can solve pretty important problems. We think in different industries, certainly ours in the mobility space. So, uh, thanks for your thanks for your questions. I hope uh, we have time to talk afterwards. I'll be around for a little bit. about our upcoming blockchain technologies, specialized study certificates, 
Um, there's some information located in the back of the room. Um, other than that, we have some snacks for you outside that you can take and enjoy your day. Thank you for joining us for our first blockchain um, boot camp, and we hope you enjoy. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>